Latin neighborhood networks race to represent in partnership with the League of Women Voters of New York is pleased to bring you an interview with Mark Fleedner, a candidate running for New York County District Attorney. He's the former head of the Major Narcotics Investigations Bureau in the Brooklyn DA's office. Hi, I'm Paul Schindler, founding editor-in-chief and associate publisher of Gay City News and Manhattan Express. The Manhattan District Attorney is the elected attorney representing New York County. The office is responsible for the prosecution of criminal violations of New York State laws here in Manhattan. Cyrus Vance has held the office since 2010, and he is seeking re-election to a third four-year term this November. We did an interview with him a few weeks ago when he was running unopposed. But in the wake of the New York Democratic primaries, and less than a month before the November 7th general election, Mark Fleedner became convinced he had an obligation to run as a writing candidate against Manhattan DA Cy Vance. Welcome, Mark, and thanks Thank for being here. Really nice to be with you today, Paul. Your candidacy is unusual in two ways. Uh, you're a writing candidate, and up until the S September primary, you were running for DA of Brooklyn. Can you talk a little bit about both those things? Sure. Yeah, since January of, of this year, I had been running on a very specific, very progressive platform, really based on my view that uh, criminal justice reform is only going to be truly obtained nationally and certainly in New York City if a prosecutor takes it on and I'm talking about really takes it on and so that was why I was motivated to run in Brooklyn and, and was putting all of my energy toward that including all of the traditional campaign you know funding efforts and, and, and staff and all that and ran in the primary and um, was proud of the work that we did with, with, with the money we had and all of that but came in third and uh, then I was going back to the business of my civil rights practice, a solo practice, and uh, Tuesday night, okay. my phone started to sort of blow up with uh, Twitter, where apparently there were folks, uh, particularly one, folk, one individual who, who began the process and said that there are certain things that have recently come out in the news about uh, the Manhattan District Attorney's decision-making process on certain cases okay. that agitated them, okay. and we need an alternative. And he said, I know this guy who was just running in Brooklyn, I know the platform, he should be our write-in. And then it grew from there. It wasn't until after it was out there in the stratosphere that uh, he emailed me to say, is this okay with you? Um, and the answer was absolutely yes, because as you, as you kind of articulated, I felt that was my responsibility. Uh, the, the things that, that he was agitated about were recent uh, disclosures with regard to how uh, Mr. Vance decided to uh, close an investigation uh, um, that's uh, having to do with the Trump family, uh, uh, Trump Soho, uh, without proceeding, and more, more emphatically, the, ad, the, the concerns about how uh, there was a decision not to prosecute Harvey Weinstein for an allegation of sexual conduct uh, contact that took place in, in Manhattan and could have been prosecuted uh, back in 2015. Okay, uh, before we move into the more specifics on those two cases, which sure. I think are important for uh, our, our viewers to understand, sure. uh, can you speak to a, a question I think a lot of people are going to have, which is, are you legally qualified yes. to serve as Manhattan DA since uh, right now you live in Brooklyn. Yeah, thank you. And that was actually a question that, that because it wasn't in my mind, uh, we w simply went to the BOE and started asking questions. And initially the city gave us the idea that you could do it from any, any borough. But in fact, um, in order to be eligible to serve, I need to be a Manhattan resident on the date of the election. And so what I'm doing right now is getting ready to, to ch change my residence from one side of the bridge to the other. I'm actually, because of my life situation, in a, in a perfectly great uh, uh, place to do that, and I'll become a permanent resident as of November 1st, presumably, because of a, of a lease that I enter into. So, yes, based on that decision on my part and the directives of the BOE at the, at the state level, um, that's what's required, and, and I'm game. I did live in Manhattan uh, years ago when I worked, served as a Brooklyn DA, mm -hmm. not too far from uh, where we're taping this in Midtown, and, uh, and uh, I think it'll be great to be back. Yeah. How long did you work in the uh, Brooklyn DA's office? Well, my goodness, I was hired by Elizabeth Holtzman in 1987. So mm -hmm. we're talking about a 30-year uh, run as, as uh, in criminal justice. And uh, I served there for five years, primarily focusing on sex crimes mm -hmm. and uh, child abuse and domestic violence in their Special Victims Bureau. Then went back to New Jersey, where I was actually born and raised and ran a sex crimes and child abuse unit. Then did a little bit of private practice. Uh, 
civil rights like I'm doing now. And then, honestly, I missed the prosecution. So I came back to New York and specifically to the DA's office in, in Brooklyn in 2006. Okay. Yeah. And you were there for how long? I was there for a uh, little over, over 10 years and, mm -hmm. and did a lot of everything, including uh, more, more of the sex crimes prosecutions, uh, homicide prosecutions, as you indicated, chief of major narcotics. And then I ended my, my reign as the chief of the newly created Civil Rights Bureau, where I was handling hate crimes and the prosecution of police for misconduct. So in New Jersey and in Brooklyn on two occasions you have well more than a decade of experience in a, in a major district attorney's office. Is, yeah. that, is that right? Oh, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the, w Brooklyn was 15 years okay. know, altogether okay. at least. Yeah. So coming on 20 years then, actually. Yeah. yeah. Right, exactly. Um, can you uh, describe for the viewers what the controversies about both the uh, Trump Soho and the Harvey Weinstein uh, lack of prosecutions involved and why yeah. some people at least are are upset at what at what Cy Vance did. Yeah, it's hard to speak to what it is that strikes people, what what disturbs them about mm -hmm. it as they go into the voting booth. But so I'm really gonna I think the best thing to do is, is, is say how I reacted sure. to it viscerally. Sure. And of course my information is based on what I'm getting from the media like everybody else. Right. But it seems to be pretty comprehensive. In in the Trump matter, um, it uh, my understanding is that there was a a, a long time, long term investigation handled by an investigative team of prosecutors into whether uh, the Trump Soho property was one that was in part marketed based on misrepresentations by members of the Trump family about how, how full it was, how many people had actually agreed to live there, which of course is a significant issue uh, for somebody who wants to buy into that property because there are financial responsibilities involved. Right. And so that would fall into the category of fraud if, if, if it could be proven. Uh, press accounts indicate in a rather unusual manner that folks within his office have been willing to speak with the press about the fact that they absolutely recommended that this be prosecuted mm -hmm. and that it was exclusively Mr. Vance's determination not to. And unfortunately, this is put in the context of donations that had been given right. um, from those in and around, uh, around the Trump family. That carried over very shortly thereafter in the public's interest into this revelation about the fact that there was this Harvey Weinstein case mm -hmm. where uh, a young woman had come forward, had gone right to the police, had done what we consider to be all the right things for a sexual assault victim to do after she's been victimized. She'd reported to the police, she'd apparently worked with the police, and actually generated an audio recording of a conversation with him the next day, which, which is evidentiary, and um, that was brought to the DA's office along with her her account of what happened to her and there was a determination not to proceed with it again mm -hmm. that's all in the context of fundraising efforts that were made by uh, those in and around um, and with the Trump I should say that it was I think it was Trump's attorney that was actually the the, the giver right um, with Weinstein I think it's more direct um, and um, and so what, what what this has said to those that I understand are motivated to, to mount a right in candidacy is that we have a scenario where it, it seems pretty crudely obvious that if you're rich and you're powerful and and largely in the context of a good old boys club I'm gonna say mm -hmm. uh, you can um, you can you can get you can buy yourself a get out of jail card to mm -hmm. put it in, in, in its really simplest terms that you are going to be subject to a different level of uh, of scrutiny from mm -hmm. everybody else that you're going to be subject to uh, a whole di different decision making process and of course what that reinforces is this sense that uh, there are some in this society who because of their color and their power and their and their pocketbooks mm -hmm. um, are able to to get a quality of justice that those who are not in that position people of color immigrants um, those who are impoverished um, people with disabilities all, all the kinds of people that have been traditionally members of the LGBTQ community are not afforded mm -hmm. because we're not in that that uh, that's that stratosphere of power that's a really disturbing message and it strikes people on a really visceral level seems to me now you worked for six years in Brooklyn while Cy Vance was the uh, lead prosecutor here in Manhattan did yeah. you ever have that impression of him prior to the Trump Soho and the uh, Weinstein stories coming out? I mean, in other words, was that a rap that, that he had at any time that you were aware of? You know, I, I, don't, I don't listen to rap so much. I just mm -hmm. kind of judge things on my own terms. I will say that as somebody who did 
more of his time in criminal justice in sexual assault and sex crimes than anybody mm -hmm. that the resolution of the Dominic Strauss-Kahn case mm -hmm. years ago mm -hmm. was was the first thing that caused me to be really uncomfortable with, mm -hmm. with that process. Because mm -hmm. again, like the Weinstein situation, uh, are, m there's the perception, and it's frankly my perception, that, you, that the word of a woman, because of who she is, mm -hmm. um, because of her station in life, is not enough to be able to present evidence to to a uh, trier of fact, or maybe a grand jury, and then a trier of fact if it's a mm -hmm. felony, um, and let them determine whether the elements of a crime are met. And 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 in in all all of these cases, we're talking about them, these these women who mustered the courage up against somebody very very powerful. Right. And in Manhattan, you know, po there there are powerful people, and they need to be held accountable. And every much the same way as those of us that are in other parts of the of the borough. Okay, so in addition to the residency uh, question, I think the other key question that folks are going to have for you, Mark, is, is this run symbolic? Do yeah. you have a reasonable shot of winning this race? Do you have a reasonable expectation of winning this race? Well, if I were to say that this isn't, you know, given the time frame, given the, the dollars spent by the incumbent and all of these things, and the fact that I don't have any of that machinery in place, if I didn't say that this was an extraordinary climb up a hell, of course. But you know what, I, I've, uh, the, the word symbolic I've been asked about in the last few days as well, I really shy away from that because to me, that is, that's a little bit disrespectful to mm -hmm. these people who I really admire who said, something's really bothering me. There's somebody mm -hmm. running unopposed that's an incumbent and we need a, we need a choice, not mm -hmm. just to sit it out and say, ugh, it, this is going to go on and on, to mm -hmm. say there's something we can do. We can write somebody in. And mm -hmm. then went and found somebody whose value system and profile and platform, really, they believed in. I think it's disrespectful for me to suggest that this is just anything. Um, I hear from these folks through social media and everything and have been nonstop that they are serious about taking this as far as they can in the time we have up to the election. Mm -hmm. So I actually think that the use of the terms involved, just to me, is, is kind of disrespectful to, to, to people that are trying to access the process in this really, really healthy way. Uh, so that's kind of my answer to that question. Okay, so then what is your vision for what you want to do in the next three or four weeks, and yeah. then what's your vision for the office going forward? Okay. Well, what I'm going to do around in the next few weeks is run around like a chicken with my head cut off, talking to as many people as I can, mm -hmm. while still trying to make a living. You know, so I made it very clear to them when we came in. You understand, I'm not bringing money into this, and I don't, mm -hmm. I'm not bringing you know access to my me 24/7. But I'll do the best I can. Mm -hmm. If you've got questions about where I stand on something, get them to me. Get them to me on social media. I, we, a, a team of volunteers now, will get back to you as fast as we can. I'll talk to as many folks like Paul Schindler and others as I can. Can, uh, to try and get the word out and then you guys you know let, let's to try and get people not only on social media but on the ground and, and, and do the best you can invite me somewhere I'll be there to tell about my platform and what is the platform what do I see for the DA's office uh, setting these scandals aside uh, Mr. Vance is somebody that clearly falls into the category of a prosecutor that has been progressive for the mm -hmm. most part, that is, has that is made, that has developed programs that are to be admired. But my vision of progress as a, as a criminal justice reformer is, is, is much broader than his. So I would be bringing a much uh, more progressive vision uh, where he talks about uh, specific crimes, broken windows offenses, minor mm -hmm. victimless offenses that he would eliminate prosecutions of. I have, I have a much more significant list. My list focuses on offenses that tend to really end up punishing people for being poor and, or end up uh, disproportionately impacting on people of color in the system just, by, just statistically. What kinds of crimes are, are you thinking of there, Mark? Turnstile offenses, okay. things like that, which I think he's already addressed. Right. The marijuana offenses, all of the marijuana offenses, right. um, trespassing offenses, um, sex work related offenses, mm -hmm. uh, offenses that, again, are victimless. Uh, and that uh, really are impacting on, on people that, that are disenfranchised in a few different ways and, and poverty can often play into it and, and so can color, frankly. Mm -hmm. I think that progressive, progressives, I think that Manhattanites, uh, New Yorkers, in fact, are, are really concerned about racial equity, really concerned about uh, uh, financial equity, and, 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 and I think that as we try to, to equalize our world and talk about all of these, these, these thorny issues, I think that criminal justice is the place where 
the impacts of inequality uh, play out more dramatically than anywhere else because we're talking about a powerful person mm -hmm. who has the ability to determine and those that he, that he or she is assigned to do so to determine who will go to jail or not mm -hmm. who will be charged with a criminal offense or not and who will get off scot-free last question sure uh, if you make your case to a voter how do they vote for uh, you? Well, first of all, we're going to put out a video that, that I believe you're going to probably find on Twitter, at Mark for DA. Mm -hmm. But they need to write in my name, and they need to get it right. Uh, it's M-A-R-C, F like in Frank, L-I-E-D-N-E-R. And um, we are looking into all of the minutiae because we want to get it right, but mm -hmm. it's probably going to mean getting to a specific part of the ballot. Do you know you're going to have to turn it over for some initiatives anyway right. this time? Right. There's not going to be a space for it. So uh, I encourage people to follow uh, follow us and follow those that follow us at Mark for DA, M A R C F O R D A. Look for a video and on Facebook and all of those things that's going to tell you step by step exactly how to get it right. And they have to spell your name exactly right. I, I, th th I think that the, the Board of Elections uh, is, has, has some fairness issues in place for that, if it's very clear who they intended to, to write in. Mm -hmm. But the best way to do it is for us to get it absolutely right. So, so we're going we're gonna to give folks a primer. Okay. Yeah. Well, listen, it was great to have a chance to talk Same. to you. Same. Thanks. And uh, we'll see you on the campaign yes. trail. Yes, terrific. New York's general elections will be on Tuesday, November 7th. For more information about voting, locating your poll site, and the candidates, you can visit the League of Women Voters website at lwvnyc.org or mnn.org. Thank you for watching Race to Represent on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Goodbye.